Hey everybody, welcome back to my YouTube channel. I am Kara Burrell. Sometimes I go by Nuanto. Sometimes I work at Mormon Stories. Sometimes I quit my job at Mormon Stories. Um, and sometimes the stories that were told by Mormons and ex-Mormons, they stay with me for a long time. And uh, I am always trying to create informational content, silly content, satirical content. Um, but this episode that I've been preparing um, today, it's put me in a bad mood. It's put me in like a heart racing mood. Um, before I start um, about this, the clips I want to show and the topics that I want to talk about, they're going to be heavy. And I'll get into the reasons why I think it's important to share and maybe a little bit out of what you more might normally see on my YouTube channel, but it's definitely still in my heart it's in my values um and just kind of want to take everybody through uh just some of the interviews not all of them but uh some of the interviews that i remember from my time at mormon stories uh which would have been from about april 2021 to march 2022 the ones that i was there that i was present for um that still shooketh me to this day um i have my uh my sister allison is playing admin right now. Thank you. So um, uh, right off the bat, I already have people saying what their favorite Mormon Stories interviews are. And uh, Colby Reddish is in the chat as well. Uh, Colby and Cami Reddish was also an extremely important interview. I would love to make a, a part two to this. I think I pulled about five interviews that I want to talk about today. And if you guys like this, um, I can go through as many. I can go through every single Mormon Stories interview that I was present for or not present for. Um, uh, and just want to remind people to be kind in the chat and to uh, uh, approach this topic that I'm going to share right now with uh, the proper empathy is kind of the subject matter overall. This is a video that I hope that like my parents could watch talking about what I do for a living, what uh, the importance of Mormon stories and John DeLynn and what he's done for over 16 years at Mormon stories podcast, the importance of giving not just the interviewees a platform to be able to share what they've been through and the effects of Mormon doctrine and culture and leaders have had on their psyche. Uh, and then just the listeners to people who have supported that podcast for 16 years who feel felt seen and heard and donate because they know the important mission of Mormon stories. So I just wanted to, do the best that I can to hype up uh, the mission of Mormon stories and the importance of people in this space that needs so much validation that there are things that have gone on to people gone on for people that are wrong and they shouldn't have gone on. And uh, the only way to get through it is to listen to other people's stories, empathize with them, validate them hear, tell your story yourself. And just, if I have one thing that I've, I've learned from Mormon stories, it's the importance of, having a space to share, you know, I guess you could say your secrets, your traumas, your things that no one else would understand. And then finding a community of people who would go, me too, you too, me too. Oh, I thought I was the only one. And then that just snowballs like you too, me too. You know, there's just so many um, unique aspects of growing up Mormon. Um, that's not quite like other religions and uh, finding other people in that community as your shelf breaks, as you've not been able to take uh, on the, the things that you have been required for you to keep your family in the eternities when that shelf breaks and when things become too much, uh, there's just a whole community out there of ex Mormons. And I am so happy and proud of the work that I was able to do with John Dillon at Mormon stories. And I just want to continue, um, and, and share some clips that still I think about on a weekly basis. So my heart's racing a little bit right now. Cause I just, was collecting these clips and I'm like in that state right now of kind of being emotional and burdensome of, of just, it's a, it's a heavy, heavy kind of trauma space. Um, but if at least what I can do is uh, provide more ways to uh, highlight these interviews, give people uh, like kind of like a commercial to see if they've never seen these episodes before and if they connect with them here, please go back and watch the full thing. Um, I know that they're long, but there's an important reason why that they're, why they, why they're long and why they, it's so important for people to understand the full depth and breadth of what it means to be a Mormon and what it means to leave the Mormon church. And sometimes that's a long episode to take, 
Um, also I want to say, Hey, shout out to Anthony Magna Bosco. Um, Anthony was also on the podcast too. It was so fun getting him in there. Um, I was trying to figure out kind of where I wanted to start today. And I've, I've done a, a video before about like logical fallacies within Mormonism and every logical fallacy, you know, that people who are defending the faith kind of enter into, it's like, they can't even understand why they're even using these logical fallacies because as as, as harsh as it sounds, it's it's this type of indoctrination where um, I just feel like people's empathy meter is broken. And uh, jokes on you, though, Mormon Church is uh, the the thing that they did teach me to do really well was mourn with those that mourn. So got you, suckers. <laughs> that thing about like being Christ-like and like mourning with those that mourn, uh, I like did it, and I like listened to people whose like experiences were less than prime <laughs> within your church. And came to realize that that's a good principle. Mourning with those that mourn is a good principle. Um, and then the double standards, uh, the lack of consent, the manipulations, the tools of undue influence, everything else that's heaped upon it doesn't align with at least the the best ideals of the Jesus Christ you guys taught me about. So um, I feel like I, I lost my faith within Mormonism because of the the good tools that I learned from what was that ideal of, you know, this enlightened figure of Jesus Christ, who I don't believe in as a, a literal deity. I'm not a Christian, but um, the the Mormon church survives on, you know, people feeling the spirit, feeling connected to their community. And guess what? I'm still connected to that community, you guys. <laughs> I still have a huge heart for Mormons in and outside of the church. Um, these ramifications again, there's a long, a long, uh, important strengthening uh of this other side of the mormon ex-mormon community of people who are no longer taking um able to no people who are no longer outsourcing their spirituality to people who don't uh live up to the ideals that they were taught within the church of honesty and integrity and um and and the and the empathy especially so um uh, and thank you so much, Anthony. Yay. And please support Anthony's channel. Street epistemology is super dope and important. Thanks so much, Anthony. Um, so if I had to just introduce this again, that there's like a, an, an, uh, empathy, uh, an empathy meter that is, that is, uh, so conditioned to, uphold the good name of the church. And, you know, when people attack and they say that, you know, well, I left the church and I don't feel that it's true. People feel like that's a, a personal attack on like, well, you're discounting that my spiritual experiences that told me it was true. That doesn't mean it's, it means it's not true anymore. Just because you say it is be like, screw you. You know, I know that the church is true. I've had these experiences. Nothing will ever shake it and deny it. And it just comes down to, do you want to be an open-minded person or not? And most people when they're in a religion, it's like, it's, it's, uh, encouraged to be closed minded about once you get your testimony, you bear it, <laughs> you just keep bearing it. You stay faithful, you endure to the end. And it's kind of a worldly principle to, to be open-minded. They say that like, you yeah, know, liberals are so open-minded that their brains fall out. Um, it doesn't matter how you label it. It doesn't matter how, uh, you want to stigmatize the idea of being open-minded. Uh, I think if it comes down to people within my tribe, people within Mormonism that I, I made a commitment when I was baptized and my endowments to mourn with those that mourn. And that's the most serious written on my heart type of spiritual commitment, regardless of the deity that I'm promising to with no loud laughter and to wear my garments that promise to mourn with those that mourn. Um, I hope that Mormons would realize that that's the most important commitment you could possibly make. It's, and then it's all within this, this framework of and commit your lifetime and talents, to the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Um, I commit it to the people. I commit my time and talents to the people who are still trying to figure out this, this mess that Joseph Smith made of this religion and people who have glommed onto the spiritual edification that it absolutely can provide. I wouldn't deny that. Um, but, but the mess that's made within it, raising um, children within a system that uh, gives them, a certain box and framework to live within and what happens when people outgrow that and they can't do that anymore. I was saying the, just the, the lack of 
awareness that some people, they just, they can't fully understand and recognize the emotions and experiences of others. They just have that blockage within them. And then they struggle to put themselves in other people's shoes and perspectives. And if people can actually click play on a video, like a Mormon stories interview, um, how comfortable is the average Mormon with sitting and hearing somebody's experiences that are negative and harmful and traumatizing within the church that they love. And I wouldn't deny that you have, I loved a lot of my time in Mormonism. I didn't leave because I was traumatized. So it's hard to hear people who could possibly have such bad experiences. Are they making it up? Are they exaggerating? But can you actually put your, put your, put yourself in their shoes? And uh, are people even aware? Uh, Do they, do they have the ability to just, sit with uncomfortable information. And then obviously on top of that, they've got the emotional bar- barriers um, where you just, you your whole life is, is built around this thing and accessing the emotions that it would take to connect with another person who I would say is within your tribe. It's, it's one thing to connect with like somebody halfway across the world in their religious experience, but uh, people who are talking about the actual lived experiences within your tribe, within the same exact structure that you've gone through, um, accessing those emotions to be able to connect with them. Um, and, uh, it's, it's a lifetime of, I would say defense mechanisms, um, which makes me really sad. Um, I've talked about this before on the Mormon stories interview, um, with John Larson, probably one of my, one of my very favorite ones that I did with John Larson and John Delin about why ex-Mormons are so angry and uh, a lifetime of indoctrination has gone into othering apostates. Um, I could get into a whole rant about that, but it's, it's, it's really difficult to uh, ever think when you're Mormon that there would be a good reason to leave. There's no good reason to leave. There's no valid reason to leave when you're really indoctrinated into Mormonism. And, um, and I don't use indoctrination as a, a slur, no, <laughs> as a, um, as a put down, I mean it in, in the quite literal terms of, I, I don't know what else to call it. If you can't empathize with people who have been harmed within your system uh, and you are only looking for deflection and putting the pla- blame back on the person instead of looking at the, the systemic issues that they're talking about that so many different people argue with uh, and your, your reasons are, are going to go back to you know, your individual experiences, your testimonies. Uh, I, can't, I can't think of a better word than just indoctrinated to side with the system that did the, that did the harm, the, the system that is protecting your mental state going forward every second of the day, then the other person who is trying to speak up and, and, and having a cry for help, you know? Um, and then obviously there's just, there's confirmation biases where people will focus in on what they want to and find the information that aligns with their pre-existing beliefs. And one for me, that made it really hard for me to empathize with people when I was Mormon. Cause again, I've said a million times that I left Mormonism at my most conservative. And I have this video called, uh, <laughs> I'm about to post the part two of it right now too, about, uh, the Mormon brain on the internet. And I have this line where it's like indoctrinations talking. It's like, Oh, what are they saying? Let me guess green hair tattoos, tattoos and piercings. Tell them there's some dumb liberal who wanted to sin anyway. I just think there's just so many ways that, uh, we, when we're Mormon, we're looking for a confirmation bias in every, what they look like, what they sound like. I bet they went to some liberal arts college. You're just like, their story can't be trusted because of their influences and not seeing that we're all just products of our genetics and our conditioning. And we were all in this, this messy system of Mormonism. And is it beyond a possibility that somebody who also has green hair tattoos and piercings (laughs) that they also have like a very valid traumatizing experience because of the systemic abuse and cover up or uh, dogmas within the church. Can you not hold those two things at the same time? Right. So, um, and uh, overall uh, being religious is, it's a highly, highly emotional experience and uh, thinking of ever living without that or honestly empathizing and, and tuning into other people's pain. It's just an entire space that emotional fortitude people sometimes don't have it and i have nothing but grace and compassion empathy for people and so with my content if you remember i made a video with my friend eve um it's my most popular youtube video of all time actually and it was with john delin and she was just having some questions about the church and we sat her down and she agreed to let us tell her about the real joseph smith 
And she's such a beautiful soul. And I love you so much. And we were talking about how like just sometimes as a mom and you're a Mormon, it's like you don't have time to go reading about the history and investigating these things, you know? And she's like, no, more like more like the emotional fortitude. And I remember that too. It's like, if I click this, if I look at this, if I empathize with somebody, I know for sure that what they're saying in the back of my mind, I know that I am going to want to connect and empathize with that. But my whole world revolves around not empathizing. (laughs) My whole world revolves around calling them liars, thinking that there's some sneaky way that Satan having some type of supernatural reason why this system is just, it's just broken. It's just a thing made up by a a frontier uh, prophet. And it was passed on without the authority from Jesus Christ. Like it's claimed it's, it's a messy, messy system that does a lot of harm to people. And uh, you can still garner a lot of strength and support. I would never deny that. You can still garner a lot of um, spirituality and peace from it answering your existential questions. Um, but is that all life is? I don't want to live the rest of my life just being like, if I just hold tightly enough to this, then if I, you know, uh, tell gay people enough that they're broken. If I just side with the church when it wants to uh, cover up for sex abuse, if I just stay faithful, faithful, faithful enough on the other end, I'm going to be hugging Jesus Christ and living with my family forever. Um, I don't want to be in a heaven where that's the type of Christ that God, that, 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 that Christ expects me to be, you know, if he existed, I don't want to be in a heaven with Joseph Smith, Brigham Young, where their mistakes that have led to so much systemic abuse and uh, just authoritarian control. That's, I don't, I don't view that as some type of utopia and some type of God that I would worship, let alone want to spend eternity with. And so you have to ask yourself in front of me, there are people from my tribe who have gone through something. Uh, Is there something within me that a knows that they're, 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 what they're saying is not an isolated incident. It's indicative of a systemic problem. And um, on top of that, is there a way that I have been snuffing down my own autonomy, my own feelings? There's shelf items I haven't even dusted off and actually looked at to know that that what they're saying is also true for me too. And um, I come to you as a white woman. I come to you as a, I don't know, highly heterosexual woman. <laughs> we'll see. I, I am um, mostly. Uh, and, uh, so, I mean, with, with all of the, with all of the privilege that goes into that, um, uh, I come to you as just a person who has not dealt with the things that native American people have within the church, queer people have within the church, um, abuse victims within the church. Um, so, uh, in, in a way, empathizing with, a lot of the reasons that people find staying in the Mormon church difficult is not always um, what, at least it wasn't always on the front of my mind. Um, But again, I think it really comes back to that the church sharpened this sword. (laughs) It, it sharpened the sword um, to empathize and, and mourn with those that mourn. Um, Thank you so much, uh, Colby, by the way. I'm so glad that you're here in the chat. Empathy is dangerous to the leaders. I could do an entire episode with that. Colby, do you want to come on my show sometime too? Uh, Colby and Cammie Reddish, you guys should go look up their interview too. Um, I love everything that Colby does and says. <laughs> and thanks again. So, uh, Anthony, you don't have to do that. Oh, you're the best. You're the best. You're the best. Thank you so much. Um, so the first uh, episode that I want to get into is a woman who we had to call her Rachel because she was so afraid that she couldn't even say her real name uh, because her family didn't want to know. She didn't want to get that out and all of the complications that go with putting your face and your story against the Mormon church. Um, And so we blurred her image and um, Rachel's story basically goes like this. If I just want to give a quick interview or I mean, sorry, a quick uh, summary Um, is that she was born and raised in a staunch Mormon family with a father who worked at BYU and held a lot of high-level positions such as bishop and MTC, branch president, mission president. Uh, She was, trigger warning, (laughs) sexually abused by her father for two years after he was mission president um, from the time she was 14 to 16. 
And then the abuse stopped when she started therapy and then started again and escalated. Um, and she told her therapist and then the abuse came out, um, when, uh, she eventually told her mom and her dad was disfellowshipped for just three months. And the stake president told her that if they had excommunicated him, he would have lost his job at BYU and it would have been a financial destruction to his family. So there's a teenager out there in the Mormon church who just wants to share that she wants her dad to stop abusing her. And the burden of her family's finances now rest on her shutting up. Um, so the story is heavy and it, and it really wrecked me. So I, I cried really heavily during this interview. Um, and I'll tell you in a second why. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and then, uh, yeah, then the therapist said that, uh, the stake president that, 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 um, the, the Mormon therapist that she was talking to the stake president, uh, they didn't have to report the abuse to anyone and she was sworn to secrecy and that her family just have to resolve, revolve, resolve it together. And there was no need to tell anyone else. And then, um, the clip that I want to share is where I started. I started crying and I got really, really triggered it was, triggered is, um, a light word for it of what happened when I was listening to this interview when I was co-hosting and, um, I, I got so angry. I had this image as she was saying this, where I would just wanted to flip the table in front of me and I had to get up cause I was going to like start weeping loudly. <laughs> so I got up and I just ran out of the room for a couple four minutes and just did some breathing exercises and came back in. Um, but yeah, then she ended up telling her brother some years later and, um, uh, and then she formally left the church in 2015 after reading the church's essays on Joseph Smith and polygamy and, you know, him marrying the 14 year old. And then she called the church in 2018 after a statement by the church about how they will always report abuse. And she ended up being in contact with Dan McConkey from Kurt McConkey as the church's law firm. Um, and he's like, okay, are you suing the church? What do you want from us? And she's like, I just want you guys to do better. Just, just do better. And everything that's happened since then is the church is pushing to not do better. As I've talked before about their amicus briefs and the way that they want to protect clergy members and, you know, their lay ministry people in charge and leadership in the church, that they are more interested in protecting them and not having to make mandatory reporters so that to save face for the good name of the church, instead of actually um, doing the right thing by by people and by children and stuff. So uh, another great episode for that is uh, Colby and Cammie Reddish's interview. Um, things. So my brother and I had this discussion. I can't. I know it was at least three, if not four. Um, but my brother and I were talking one time and he said, you, you know, we should do more as a family. We need it, you know. And, um, and he said something about my dad and I was like, eh, you know, just snotty. Made a snotty remark. And he just said, I am so sick of how you treat him. Do you know the sacrifices dad's made for us? And, you know, just went off. And I was like, yeah, if you only knew. And he's like, what? If I knew what? And he was really like, you're a shit. Like, you know, I can't believe how you treat dad. Like just, and I was just like, and he would push me and he, you know, he was saying, what, what you say, if you only knew what Rachel, what is it that we need to know? And because I can't see why you, how you could justify treating dad this way. And so I said to him, I will tell you, but you have to promise not to say anything. And I, he's like, what? And I said, I promised mom and dad, I would never say anything to anyone. And he said, I promise I won't, I won't. And I told him. And what he did and what he said fundamentally changed my life for good. 
And he told me, I don't know how you're even functioning. I've gone from wondering how you could be so shitty to that to how you can even be in the same room with him. And he told me he was sorry. And that he loved me. But then what he did. So he went the next day to my parents. And he said, Rachel told me what's been happening and what happened between her and dad. And you guys aren't being fair to her. We do think she's a shit because we don't understand. And you aren't giving Rachel the love and the support that she needs to heal. She needs that from the siblings. That's a lot for you to carry. Yeah. It's too much. So my mom said to me, you know, your brother told us that you guys had talked. And I was immediately, like, angry. Like, he promised he wouldn't say anything. Defending them. Well, not, not yourself, I was just but... like, I thought I was going to be in trouble. Yeah. Like, I had promised. Yeah. And... Now he's told him, yeah. and um, and she, my mom just said we're sorry, and I didn't realize how the kids felt about you. And so they told all the siblings. Um, they had a family council. My dad told all of them what had happened, and that. Breaking of the silence was so powerful. I cannot emphasize enough how secrets damage and hurt families and individuals and victims. Because ultimately, my brother was the first one to say and demonstrate by his actions that I mattered, that my abuse was enough, and that my healing was more important than keeping my dad safe. And no one had said that in the whole time. It was always about protecting him. Even your mom, you're saying. Even my mom, with everything she did right, When you tell someone to keep a secret like that, it, it inevitably puts shame. Why can't we tell? Because it's embarrassing and it's shameful. I'm so uh, heavy, right? Sorry. Sorry to start so heavy. But it's so it was actually at that moment in the Mormon Stories interview um, where, yeah, I got the most triggered that I've ever gotten in any interview where uh, – Rachel's there pouring out her heart and um, somebody who went through something similar in my life, which is, this is not the time to talk about me um, feeling that instinct of how you could say purity culture, how patriarchy, uh, how just so many things within this Mormon system make people feel so small and there, like I said at the beginning of this, there's nothing more painful than when you're looking for, you know, existential questions to be answered. How do I be with my family? How do I self-actualize? How do I do all of these things? And you're told it's by making yourself small for men and it's to make yourself small and hidden and shut up. And whatever's happened to you is the least of everyone's concern because we have to save face for a bigger know nothing name that has authority over you. And you're just born there. You're just a kid who's just trying to find um, love, connection, joy, whatever you can. And you're in this system that tells you to be small. And when you ask and are brave enough to stand up and say, this thing happened to me, do I get anything? And Rachel's story is just so painful and so powerful that um, she had to deal with this lifetime of people um, in her, like, well, her siblings, especially just thinking that she just had a bad teenage attitude towards her dad, not knowing that he was abusing her throughout all of these years. And then finally having that secret come out and being able to, like she said, 
not have to feel so small, like actually having advocates for her and how every abuse victim needs to be able to feel like they have an advocate for them. So within the Mormon context, who are you going to get mad at? Are you going to get mad at ex Mormons who are advocates for abusers? Um, because it's really interesting. The whole, you know, Hey, ex Mormons leave the church, leave it alone. Ex Mormons like Nemo, the Mormon and 21st century saints in the UK Ex-Mormons are the ones for the last few years who have been pushing and advocating strongly for the church to implement background checks in the UK for all of the leaders that are going to be working with children, youth, and, and you know, adults. Was that Mormons who, who did that? Was it the leadership? Was it the top down who said, oh my gosh, of course. No, it's, it is ex-Mormons who are the ones looking out for the Mormons at the end of the day. It's, it's people like I'm guessing Rachel, me too, anybody who has been abused as a child, don't you wish that somebody wouldn't have left it alone? Don't you do, do Mormons, do Mormon children right now who in 20 years are going to be ex Mormons because of the abuse that they endured within the church. I bet that those Mormon kids are glad that ex Mormons don't leave the church alone. So, um, <sighs> uh, yeah, it's, it's really heavy. So then at this point, um, that's, I'm pretty sure this is the exact moment. Cause I got the exact same chills again. It's like the exact same moment. I can think I could have heard myself where I stood up and walked out the door. And what I was feeling at that moment in that interview was just, uh, how beautiful, uh, sibling relationships can be. And I love my sister, Allison. She's here in the chat so much. My sister, all my, all my siblings have been, um, my sisters, I forget my brothers. <laughs> No, no offense, uh, but um, having such deep, wonderful bonds with my sisters and how much they've helped me and we've helped each other. Um, there's nothing more beautiful than sibling relationships where they see you and they want to stand up and advocate to you um, against the, the, the horrors, the tsunamis of whatever the outside world has to offer. So um, anyway, I just got chills when I watched that back just now as well. So Next, um, I am going to move into, if I press this button, what happens? Mm, we're going to go to this one. Um, uh, so the next one I'm going to play is, um, this is probably like one of my very first Mormon Stories interviews. And um, this is Kelly and Kayla Mikesell and another couple of just beautiful souls. I was so grateful to connect with them again. There's nothing more fun than if you're the type of person like me is <laughs> like, you meet somebody new and you're like, please tell me your entire life story so that we can get through the small talk and know each other intimately and go off of that, you know, springboard from there. So it's so nice to sit down and have these long, long interviews. So the Mike Sell family were super, super sweeties. And, um, uh, the clip that I wanted to play that shook me was the story basically goes um that at least at this section of the interview um kayla was talking about after her parents uh divorce and remarriage and just feeling very isolated not knowing where to go and then having a boyfriend at 14 years old and um engaging in a sexual activity with them within uh, this this Mormon religion and not being allowed to do that, but really not really knowing where else to go um, for, you know, validation and stuff. Her parents weren't really available for her. And after she was found out that that's what she was doing, being dragged into the Bishop's office. And um, I, it's, it sounds like the most traumatizing thing that I could ever imagine. And if we know, Hey, we don't, we don't want our 14 year olds, you know, having unprotected sex. You, you got my vote on that Mormons. I absolutely don't. Uh, but the amount of shame and just, I would say outrageous misunderstanding of childhood psychology and development um, that the amount of like trauma and torture that she was put through um, in her Bishop's office again, in, in Mormonism, a Bishop is he's, he's an accountant or he's a tire salesman. He's just somebody from the congregation that's asked to, be the person who holds the keys over this congregation to interview people about their worthiness and um, doesn't have the the training to be able to handle such outrageous, messy situations. And so again, I'm always trying to bring this back to a high 
like 10,000 foot view from a systemic level um, that these, there are people who are going through traumatic events that are just above the pay grade of bishops, but within the Mormon context, uh, you know, any marriage can survive. If you put Christ at the center of it, any bishop can be able to know what to say. If he's in tune with the spirit, he has the keys over the entire ward and there's nothing, there's nothing more to say there. The evidence shows for itself that these are just some men are just trying their best with their conditioning and what they understand, what they think they're supposed to do. But I unhealthily just put so much energy and effort into him because I wasn't getting it anywhere else. Um, and it, in, in some ways I'm glad because it, it made me the person that I am today, the, the experiences that, that happened, but in other ways, it just makes me sad that I was so alone and that this is how it ended up happening. So I, we are dating definitely boyfriend and girlfriend, and I'm only 14 and, um, end up losing my virginity to him. Um, well, like I said, both of us selfie. Yes. And I didn't feel guilty about it. I loved him. We had been dating for a while, as much as 14-year-olds can. And I, yeah, I remember not feeling really guilty about it and feeling like, what on earth is wrong with me? Because I should feel guilty. I did it. It was in the moment type thing, but something is wrong like with me. The church is true, and I'm just messed up. And then in Young Women's, they're talking about modesty. And um, I just had this feeling that all these like leaders thought of me as just temptress and tempting to all the boys in our ward and everything um, that I just felt like an outcast even within the ward. And they always talk about the young men in the light of, you know, women having to dress modestly for them. They never talk about young women having sexual thoughts or feelings or anything. So I, once again, am reclusing into a corner even more because I'm alone. I'm sitting in young women's looking at the other girls around me and thinking none of them are looking at their, you know, their crushes and, and wanting to like make out or, or, you know, do things with them. I'm just crazy. I like, I have a serious problem <laughs> because they don't talk about sex and especially for women. Um, and they, and once again, it's, you're a teenager, your hormones are through the roof. Like, how are you, you know, like it, it's not just the young men who are having these emotions. It's young women too. And so it's your fault, Kayla, because you weren't practicing thought stuff. Yeah. Yes. I wasn't doing the thought stopping techniques. <laughs> and, so, totally no, yeah. <laughs> and so, and so John's like, Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I, yeah, like I said, we're cruising that corner even more, just getting all the validation and attention from him that we are actively, we're sexually active and, um, no birth control, no, mm -hmm. n nothing, because who am I going to go to? And I'm not going to like, y yeah, do sex ed, right? Yeah, nothing, nothing. And I, and I was so young that I hadn't even gotten into high school when they teach sex ed. And so I just, so yeah, not great decisions. <laughs> um, but a lot of it was just, like I said, just wanting that love. Um, and so this goes on and this is just where a huge pitiful moment, the worst experience of my entire life. Um, we're continuing our relationship and texting. And I, um, I gotta be careful about this because he, um, I know that he's a good person and has a life and is continuing and everything. And I wish the best for him. Um, and both of us made mistakes, but there were times where I did not want to participate in things sexually. And I was forced to, or cursed, whatever you wanna, however you wanna say that. And once again, with no sexual education or anything, I didn't know that I could say no. Um, and never talked to anybody about it um, until recently. Um, and there was just one moment, like Callie said, how you just got pictures in your head, um, that there's a picture in my head of being in his room with my face down, looking into a mirror in the side and just looking at my blank face um, and not wanting to be there. Um, <sighs> um, I just want to stop for a second. Uh... So what I have to say about that, um, my internet's telling me that it's kind of low right now. So if this is choppy, 
let me know. There's not really anything I can do to fix it. Uh, what I want to say about that right now, just as a moment is how, how much a 14 year old is just obviously not prepared to go through that type of coercion sexually, uh, and to understand their own, their own hormones. There's just so much confusion. And obviously it's everything within the Mormon church is just swept under the rug. And we ignore that those things even happen, especially for girls. Um, uh, but moreover, something that's been really on my mind a lot lately is was listening to a psychologist uh, talk about this the other day um, on the interwebs about how even like enthusiastic consent <laughs> is really tricky when there's when there's coercion into it and everything is so intertwined. And so even in the best case scenarios, um, sexuality in, in even a Mormon marriage it's just things that can be so coercive um, and transactional. And I can't even imagine as a 14 year old uh, having to feel like you to keep, you know, this boyfriend, uh, boyfriend around and, and keep things going. And like she was introducing that uh, things were so dark and she didn't know where to turn. She didn't have the support of her family and just how confusing of a time that is. And all of that within this purity culture framing that, the last thing on Kayla's mind she's ever going to be able to do is, is talk honestly and openly that she's gotten to the point where she wants to have sex with her boyfriend. And that that's the, that's the last conversation, uh, how to be able to do that healthily with a Mormon family and her, her dad's a Bishop. I don't know if he was a Bishop at that time, but very serious, um, staunch Mormon family. So, oh, my heart just goes out to Kayla. So, and, and then it gets even <laughs> worse i made a clip out of this on tiktok and i will say it's still i think it's what i'm about to show you right here i think i when i was at mormon stories and i was making their tiktoks i uh i'm trying to find the exact moment where she tells this story because the tiktok has like a bajillion gazillion millions of views and i want to start it at the Get right first so my parents are second. sitting outside so about you're, what you're 14 you're yeah. alone with the mormon adult bishop man and he's asking yes you. and not 30s or 40s 50s i mean 70s, 70s. Yeah. um and so yeah how, like how many times um orally questions like that um just also and then it when yes and times yes um masturbation yes like masturbation as well just literally everything mm -hmm. um and then as traumatic as that was crying horrified he then asked my parents to come into the room and says what do you need to tell them and i mean mm. how long did i sit there in silence long time. i just sat there mm. just in silence he wanted me to tell my parents with him in the room and i don't even remember what i exactly said i don't know if i said i have i've had sex mm -hmm. or oh it was something like that and i just said it I genuinely don't remember anything after that. I thought my brain has, I don't remember. I just remember saying it. I remember that experience. And I don't remember much after that. We were obviously completely cut off from each other. Mm -hmm. um, our families, like, you know, no contact, everything. But we went to the same school. You a very, phone, your yeah, iPod. everything gone. We hardcore punished her. Yeah. Were you in the, was it you or her mom? Me. She was in the room. So it was my dad and, and Kelly. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so then I am another experience I don't want to go into happens with the same boy. Um, and who, so 14 year old who is sitting with a 70 year old man, uh, without any parental supervision, uh, going through a completely traumatic retelling of everything sexually that she did with her boyfriend. Um, please Mormons, justify and educate me on why that is the, the Christ God. <laughs> he, he knows everything. He has put these people in place. A best faith interpretation is, you know, mistakes of men. Um, but I, do you want that to be the type of Bishop that you have? Do you want to have the type of structure in a church where that is, that is normal? That is a normal mode of operation in Mormonism. Uh, somebody was talking about Bishop Roulette in the in the comments. 
Bishop roulette is this phrase that we sometimes use. Some bishops are awesome. <laughs> Some bishops would never do that. Some bishops are, uh, I had, I had, uh, my bishop in my teenage years was Elder Oaks's son. <laughs> Just let that sink in for a second. Um, overall, nice guy, stern guy. Um, uh, asked me if I was pregnant every six months in my bishop's interviews from the time I was 12 till the time I was 18. Didn't appreciate that. Um, but I never had to confess ever anything to him. It was my bishop when I was 19, right after him in my home ward. Um, bishop, bishop Rick, Bishop Rick is his name. Um, Favorite guy, favorite bishop, couldn't ask for a better bishop. Um, And that's the bishop roulette that I had when I had to go and and confess to him. Going away to uh, work as a counselor when I was 19 and coming back after the summer and telling him all about the the drugs I did and the girls I kissed and the the happenings of what I was up to (laughs) that summer. He was, he was, he was, he was, he was a homie. He was like a, yeah, just like, that's just kind of like what people do sometimes. Just like, yeah, that's why alcohol is not good because you make some choices that you don't want to make. But overall, uh, Mormonism is a system where these men, they have these keys and these, this mantle of authority unearned. And what the, the thing that I'm always the stickler on is regaining your autonomy after it's been taken and given away. And I didn't pull this clip, but I get chills every time I think about this. I think about this all the time. Uh, God bless Margie Dillon. Uh, Margie has done a, a series of episodes with um, that I was there for. I she's she's changed my life in so so many ways. And there's this one interview where she talks about you know the commitment that you you just it's never asked. It's just a given in Mormonism that you're going to give your autonomy over to these men in leadership, but especially. Uh, your sexuality and also this, the trauma of going through childbirth and child rearing and what it does to you psychologically. And as a woman, you just are expected that that is your plight in life. As much as I'm grateful that Mormonism isn't as uh, intense as other cults. And I, I'm, I'm the nuance how I understand there, there's a difference, but the deep seated pain that is, I still unpack about uh, what, what Margie told me in that interview where she's, she's crying and she's like, it was never asked. It was always a given. And like, whenever people ask me about advice about coming out of the church, I always have to say back to them. I'm like, recognize where your autonomy was taken away from you from an unearned authority where it was given, where it was taken. And then what are the modes that you need to step into your own self of who you are? that nobody else gets to say who you are. Who are you outside of what people told you that you are? Who are you outside of the authority of the Mormon church telling you who you are, how you show up, what they are entitled to know about you? And I mentioned this last night about this Brene Brown clip that Aaron and I, my husband and I want to go into, and it's about that no one's entitled to know your shame story. And it's one of those things where it's like, they don't even People are saying things they don't even know how perfectly they relate to religion, how perfectly what Oprah and Brene Brown are talking about relates to Mormonism. And it's exactly what Kayla's talking about here. So this is an entirely traumatic experience that Mormonism comes in and thinks it's entitled to uh, lay a claim to, tell you the way that you're made right again through some of the worst psychological practices <laughs> you could ever um, force onto a teenager, let alone anyone. Uh so thanks again for everyone for showing up for this live stream. Um, if I'm doing a good job, please uh, go down to the description and uh, find my Patreon, my Venmo, my donor box. Um, I love to keep making videos every day would be great. Um, so I just uh, trying to throw this together again. I'm just like, I just need to like cry it out for a second and take a, take a breather in a second. So everyone take a breather with me. Um uh, next thing that I wanted to go into, uh, is, you know, no uh, sexual- let's see. Uh, the next one is, uh, Gerardo. Um, so Gerardo Simano is a current, current employee of Mormon stories podcast. Gerardo sweet as can be, um, the, the camera that I'm using right now, he told me which one to buy and help me set up this week. So, uh, Gerardo is a real one. He's a good one. And basically just to summarize a, a couple things about Gerardo's story. Um, 
he was raised in Mexico to a Mormon family. Um, he knew that he was gay from a young age and his Mexican Mormon parents put him in some conversion therapy through an online therapist who's actually, if anyone knows his name, he's actually quite famous because he came out as gay a couple of years ago. He's bald. He just looks like somebody who's been repressing. So that was his, his, his conversion therapist all through his teens and his parents paid to have these like weekly, you know, therapy, conversion therapy sessions with him. Um, didn't work, didn't cure him, uh, went up to BYU, Idaho. And, uh, what, what does at least make me happy? I would, <laughs> I'd love to do an entirely different one of the, all the Mormon stories interviews where I laughed the hardest. Cause there's, there's like Lizzie and Spencer beans. Those are like two of my high school best friends that I got on the podcast and we laughed so hard. And there's this episode with Gerardo. There's a part of this where me and John and Gerardo are like crying, laughing, um, about Gerardo and his, his boyfriend at the time, his now husband, Zach, how they were at BYU, Idaho and they were just roommates and they had to like put on this big show for everyone that they were just roommates. And it's like a sitcom. It's just kind of like a funny, quirky thing. And then it like gets very serious. We're like, and also the trauma of having to do that. So finding reasons, there's also just a lot of absurdity and humor and this stuff too. Um, but I, this, this part of Horido's story will always stick with me of uh, the, this experience of like, I started this, thing about empathizing with people and putting yourself in their shoes and the gay Mormon experience. Um, the only way to do that is just listen to people's stories and their lived experiences and just let them tell their stories. And Mormon stories is obviously the, such a good platform for people to be able to do that of, I can't even imagine what it would be like to live in a world of like a bizarro world where me being attracted to men is, would be this would be the gross thing my attraction to men since I was younger. I mean, I was a girl in middle school. I was, I wasn't like boy crazy because it was very clear that I was like really ugly and no boys like me, <laughs> but my attraction to men <laughs> was still very high. And I even made like what I called my hot men pillow. And I took all of like Heath Ledger and, uh, Marky Mark. And like, even though this was like way after Marky Mark was popular, Mark Wahlberg, I just like took all the hot men and I ironed them on a big pillow and all of my ward, like young women's leaders thought it was so funny. And for a ward activity, for a young woman's activity, we all did hot men pillows. And uh, I had a friend who was like printing off a picture of Paul Walker, like shirtless and putting him on a pillow. Like that's the type of like approval of heterosexuality and like semi-sex positiveness that I was at least allotted in my Mormon upbringing. And just like, if, what if all of my attraction to men was, and that was the sinful thing. What if it was a bizarre world where I, I had to be forced um, to be gay? Mm, uh, putting yourself in somebody else's shoes and what type of mental strain that that would be under. Just one thought uh, technique amongst many that I wish I would have thought of much sooner when I was much more homophobic within the church. And um, Harada tells this story here um, about when Zach proposed to him while they were in Mexico visiting his family they had to sleep in separate beds. Obviously his parents weren't, they knew that he was um, struggled with all of these things and just thought that Zach was, I think just like his friend or something and not being able to share something as wonderful and pivotal, pivotal as this, this, this relationship and the beauty of bringing your partner home, somebody that you love, somebody that you care about, you want to spend your life with and, the, you can't even acknowledge that to your parents, let alone have them respect it or be excited for it the same way that, you know, I was at 19 when I bring home a, a boy and my parents are like, great, let's get you married. You know, um, just as a human, what a, the, the, the beauty of, of finding a partner and loving them and wanting to share a life with them. And, and um, I can't imagine the, the pain and struggle that people like Gerardo have to go through when that's not respected and, uh, inside of their family. Um, so I think I have it queued up. I was hard about that. Well, I don't think at the time it's super hard, but just right now thinking about it, it's like, um, these moments that are just normal and, uh, of anyone's experience in their life, like any Mormon heterosexual person, like they're happy when they're engaged and they post their pictures and, 
they tell everyone and their parents and the families are happy for them. Um, and he, I was here seeing my parents who, who live in another country and I have my fiance right there with me and I can't tell them that, that we're engaged. And a lot of it had, had to do with the fear of how they would react. I mean, what my mom had said at some point, and also um, the fear that my parents could potentially um, tell on me and and get me out of BYU Idaho, right? Right. Things like that do happen. Yeah. Oh, I think it would have happened if I had told them at that Your point. Parents would have called BYU. Yeah, at that point. Yeah. Um. And the same for his parents. The same. And just to make sure what he just said does not go uh, uh, under the radar. He's talking about going to a church school where part of the honor code is you cannot be in a same-sex relationship and fearing that his own parents would get him kicked out of school and side with the honor code for the church that they belong to um, to get him kicked out of school if he was just authentic and truthful with his own people who gave birth to him and raised him. This is the type of indoctrination that is, again, what more, what better word can you use when people will side with this, this system and this institution over their own child's well-being? The amount of mental strife and uprooting that that would do to a son um, because people will side and think that they are doing what's right for them. Will kicking Gerardo out of BYU Idaho cure his gayness? No, but it will. All it will do is show that the institution of the Mormon Church trumps familial relationships. And the fact that he's like, my parents, they would have done that at that point. And I'm sure that happens. Like John said, that happens. That happens. What kind of institution, Mormons, are we talking about here where people's allegiance is so deeply tied to standing up for a freaking honor code, um, knowing that they put their son through years and years of coercion therapy and it didn't work and that they're willing to kick their son out of school for it. <sighs> um, let me keep playing it, though. The same thing. You're going to tell them. Um, and so we came back and uh, we moved into an apartment and we had separate rooms. We each had a room and we were leaving with five, with four other guys at the same time. Okay. Well, I want to hear that conversation. Like, wait, what if we move in together? You know, you're engaged. <laughs> I think oh, we I had already been planning on moving uh, to the same apartment how'd that uh, conversation go uh just let's move in together yeah just like i mean we're dating let's just move in together take that byu housing <laughs> to keep people apart take like, that, no take that honor code yeah because <laughs> that's a huge deal at byu like uh i think that's mostly what i wanted to play right there i wasn't planning on being on that episode so i wasn't wearing any makeup and uh, i was like i was wearing my doordash to use a shirt too and i was like i'm not ready to be in this interview um, but uh, my heart really goes out to people who try to go to church-owned schools for the, you know, the reduced tuition. It's a good education in a lot of ways, uh, hoping that they will be able to survive the heteronormative, you could say, culture there. And uh, that's right at that part of the interview is where they get into uh, sneaking around and pretending that they're just roommates. And it's, again, it's like a sitcom. It's kind of a cute story. Um, so much love to Gerardo and Zach. They're such a cute couple. And, uh, uh, I even went, when I went to the Taylor Swift concert in uh, March, I got to hang out with them because they were also going to the Taylor Swift concert. So they're hardcore Swifties like me. And, um, it's, uh, it was really hard. Like I said, to start this episode and my heart was like, I was all over the place. So the only thing that was able to cure me was listening to Taylor's version of, um, speak now. And uh, again, remember how I started this entire uh, episode? What am I calling this? Live stream? Ranting? <laughs> We're uh, Taylor Swift lyrics. 
they're they're more deep and more connective than anyone knows when the lyrics to speak now where it's like you know they said speak now to like interrupt the wedding it's like mormonism you said to empathize and mourn with those who have worn you're like i'm just they said speak now anyway um can't speak highly enough of gerardo Samato. and um let me go to the next one is um nope I will never in my life know how to use slides on here. Um, so whenever people ask me, what's your favorite Mormon stories interview of all time? There is nothing like this one. There is nothing you will ever find that is packed to the brim with information. It, it, it really hits all of the things. Uh, it's, it's information and it's the lived experiences of three uh, Native American women who were raised Mormon and left the church and is a quick, quick, quick uh, explanation for those of you who don't know. Um, uh, Mormonism is based around, you know, Joseph Smith starting this religion and saying, Hey, all of these Brown people, these native Americans here, what if I, what if I shoehorn them into uh, my my new religion, my new book that I'm writing here, the Book of Mormon. And the Book of Mormon itself is a text that explains how it's a scriptural text that's like these golden plates that Joseph Smith found and these writings that were from uh, the ancestors of the current Native Americans that populate you know, North America. How did they get here? They are ancient Jews. They sailed on a boat from... Jerusalem in 600 BC, Nephi and his family, they came on over and they populated North America. They were God's chosen people. They split off in the good guys and the bad guys, the Nephites and the Lamanites, and they fought, fought, fought their wars. And that's the story of, you know, the Book of Mormon. These righteous people halfway through Jesus comes after he dies in, after Jesus Christ, you know, dies and is resurrected. He uh, floats on over to the Americas uh, and blesses the people there, sinks other of them into the sea who are wicked, and the Lamanites and Nephites battle, battle, battle. And eventually the Lamanites are the people who turn away from God. They turn away from Jehovah, Joseph Smith's God. <laughs> and doing so their for their unrighteousness, their skin is turned dark so that they are loathsome and they are undesirable to the light white or the lighter white skinned people, the righteous people. And that's a curse that God puts upon their skin that is still with the native Americans today. So the native Americans are special. So Gerardo talks a lot about that in his interview as well. Um, like Latinos are also told that they are the uh, ancestors of these people. And so there's this interesting thing that happens in Mormonism where it's people who are indigenous to the Americas, especially um, where they just, you know, their ancestors freaking came across the Bering Strait, but Mormonism has a whole different idea about how their people got here and it has to do with their narrative. It has to do with the Mormon narrative. Again, going back to the theme of like Mormonism, telling you who you are, telling you who your history is and a million, obviously disrespectful things about that, but there's just layers and layers and layers of so many things that go into being a, a, a Latino or um, Native American in in Mormonism, being told that your dark skin is a curse, but also you at least were part of that chosen people. You still can trace your lineage all the way back to Lehi, Lehi and his family. And uh, throughout, from the very beginning of the church with Joseph Smith sending missionaries out to go take Native American women as polygamist wives and go convert these Lamanites, uh, as they would call them, they're not... You know, individual tribes of North America, Mormons would just label them as like, you guys are the Lamanites. You guys are part of our narrative now. And a lot of Native Americans have converted and and do play a role in, in Mormonism. And you can go to like the Book of Mormon Evidence Conference, truly does believe the Rod Meldrum Firm Foundation that I talk about sometimes. You can go and there's an entire section of the day dedicated to Native Americans who believe strongly in Mormonism, um, getting up and and also propagating this myth and this story about where their people came from. And, um, and yeah, Polynesians as well. Uh, thanks uncle Maui. And, uh, 
So if you can imagine there people, once they, uh, have their shelf break for a million different reasons within Mormonism, uh, being able to unravel what story was told about them, their skin color, the reasons that they were, uh, uh, marginalized within their own Mormon communities because of this myth that their ancestors turned away from Jehovah, uh, what that does to the psyche of a person. There's just so, so, so much to get into. And like I said, it goes back to Joseph Smith started this converting people. And then, um, Ezra Taft Benson and yeah, like Spencer W. Kimball, I would say are two of the biggest Mormon prophets in the last in the last century who really made it their mission to convert the Lamanite people to Mormonism. And there's quotes from, uh, from Spencer W. Kimball where he'll say that like, well, what we did was we started this Indian placement program and we took these Indian kids out of their homes. And now they're living with these white Mormon families and if you actually look and you stand them in a line with other people who are in our Indian placement program, you can actually t tell that their skin is lighter and their countenance has changed just by being around other white Mormons. And it's like, what more evidence do you need? <laughs> uh, some of the most horrible things uh, have been done in the name of this Mormon narrative that being white and delightsome is of God and your skin will turn, your countenance will change. Um, and in this interview, they talked to three women. We talked to three women, um, uh, Monica, Sarah, and Anne. And they they have, it's, it's again, one of the most important interviews. It's just packed with everything. It's, uh, prophets who don't know how to prophesy, who don't know how like DNA and like melanin in the skin works. Uh, you have uh, uh, people who are, trying to reconnect with their heritage that was told to them that they can't connect with. They can't do these tribal dances because those are remnants of the Lamanite past that are evident of God. You know, if you, if you think of, of the, the traditions of, of a Native American tribe, those are only traditions because they turned away from Jehovah. If they wouldn't have turned away from Jehovah, they wouldn't be doing all of these. They wouldn't, they wouldn't be doing these dances. They would be, I don't know, Christian sitting in a church still. I have no idea. So the, the uh, amount of suffocating down people's indigenous connection with their heritage was a big part of Monica and Sarah and Anne's upbringing as native Americans in the Mormon church. So this episode that we did was the most mind blowing stories. <laughs> like they're talking about rubbing lemon juice on their skin, uh, to just try to do anything to lighten their skin. And it's just jam packed with stories like that. And I also just like to say that this is, you know, that it's the most important and like favorite episode that I turn people to, um, because I was the most tired I'd ever been in my entire life. Hands down. We, me and John had just filmed an entire day and then like a psycho, he's like, and also we're going to do a live stream right now. And so I, you know, those times in your life where you're like, you're on camera, you know, you know how sometimes you're on camera and you're like, I am going to die. I'm so tired. But the importance of what they were saying was the only thing that was just keeping my eyes just like bugged out of my head that I couldn't believe that I was, what I was hearing. So one section of that that um, Anne was talking about, I believe she was adopted into a white family and just marginalized in, in so many terrible and horrific ways throughout her childhood and in every lesson kind of being pointed to that like Anne's the Lamanite, you know, in, in her Mormon lessons and singing uh, Book of Mormon stories as a primary song. And like there's actions that go with it. And there's like, you know, then you put like your know, feathers behind your head and just so many things that she just is kind of taught to feel demeaned. And that's her place in the world that her ancestors turned against Jehovah and she still has the mark on her from those things. And, uh, and all of, all of that white supremacy that is so active and normal, like mainstream mid-century American culture and stuff that is so sticky that sticks on the minds of all of these old men who still lead the church that still today um, have 
all of the inclinations to do and say some of the most racist things that you would have hoped would have been left behind 50 years ago or longer. Um, and things like, you know, intermarrying with a white person will at least breed out the brownness from your seed. So that's kind of what she was talking about there. Um, and then, uh, the, then, uh, Sarah who runs, um, Lamanite, I can't remember the name of her, uh, her, it's like her website, her project. If anyone knows the name of it, uh, it's Lamanite something, something. Um, and it's just a, a really important entire subsection of people and experiences that I always want to make sure that we highlight and we remember. Um, cause it's, there's a million different reasons why Mormonism its doctrines, its practices are practice, practice, practices are, are harmful and it can, it, it always needs to be highlighted. The impacts that this actual book of Mormon doctrine, this is, this is not some like way that you can nuance or scrub certain things away. These are, these are things that are still in the book of Mormon today and have been uh, infused into um, yeah. Black and Brown people's minds about why their skin color is the way that they are as a, uh, as a, whether it's fence sitters in heaven before they came down again, just the narratives of what Mormonism wants to say about why they are that the way that they are and how painful it can be to, to know how long you've spent your whole life, not being in touch with your, your true self, your true heritage and letting another entire religion map onto your psyche. Some of the worst things about you for for their reason for their for reasons that involve you being small so they can be big um uh and then yeah i want to make sure i play what sarah says here there's so it's like i kind of buried it all like you know at at in my teens i'd been faced with having to choose i was i don't know i was 11 12 maybe might not have been a teenager yet but i was visiting in in metlakatla and I, I was so excited because I was wanting to join in the dancing. I was old enough, but then I knew I wasn't supposed to. And I remember just sneaking into the lodge and watching the dancers. And I was like, okay, I have to choose. That's when I realized I had to choose between my Tzimtzian heritage and being Lamanite. And I was like, I have to, you know, my people need redeemed. And there's like all that pressure to make sure that you're doing what God wants. And I remember actively choosing Mormonism and being Lamanite and letting go of everything. And it's like, at that point, I just kind of stuffed, <laughs> stuffed it all down. And, you know, you internalize a lot, just like as a female, you internalize a lot of the sexism in church and you just, oh, this is, this is all okay. Everything's okay. It doesn't, you know, you just kind of internalize and stuff down anything that's uncomfortable. And I did that with the Lamanite racism and cultural shaming and skin shaming, I just stuffed it down and I just ignored it. But the thing is, is once women have children, like things totally shifted and suddenly everything mattered to me. And I was like, how am I going to help my kids navigate all of these things without them feeling as much pain as I did? And, you know, and that was some of my leaving journey too, was how can I teach all these children things that are whitewashed or untrue? And I was trying to make it work because I didn't want to leave because like, you know, all my family, they're still all in. And there's just this, it's just kind of heartbreaking to have your whole world fall apart. Yet it's also so healing. Like I'm glad I took the path I did because there's been so much healing with my, my Native American family, my Tzimtzian family and with my children. But as a mom, before I get sidetracked, going back to you and like kids are still being taught this. People think it's in the past. And I'm like the, the seminary manuals specify skin color, like the teacher's manual when it says to, and it's trying to give the teachers like how to you know handle you know here's this conversation if this comes up this is your answer 
and it specifies skin. So no matter what apologist or people want to say, oh, we don't know if it's skin or not, it's skin. And Native Americans are still being identified as Lamanites um, in official like church doctrine. Like you can't. Say yeah. Again, that can't be swept under the rug. Like the, the manuals and things are still saying these and these narratives are still being propagated. I'm going to move my window. <sighs> that didn't do anything. Hold on. Oh, how's that? Um, yeah. Um, I, the, the I, part of that, that I, that I really do identify with a lot is once you have kids that you were told to have, you know, within Mormonism and you have your own shelf items. And I had a moment when I was, I, again, I was, I was the most Christian, the most conservative, the most Jesus freaky that I could have been when I left the church, but I still was like having uh, enormous amounts of doubts and my kids were still going to church. And I was like, I can just figure out a way to have them have the structure of going to church. I cried when my husband told me that he wasn't going to go to church anymore. And I was like, okay, I'll do it my, by myself. And I, I pictured that my kids would have the wonderful experience in Mormonism going to girls camp. Like I did, like, I couldn't imagine my kids not having that structure. And it was all just about like, I just couldn't imagine the structure, but the teachings themselves I knew were so wrong and harmful. And one day my daughter, when she was like three years old, came home from primary and she was wearing a wristband that said future missionary on it. And I gagged and I said, Oh, oh no. <laughs> like the, just staying within this structure they're, they want to raise my kids to go out and teach their, teach their doctrines to go out and be missionaries for them. Um, if I can't even picture, I would be so disappointed if my daughter grew up to go be a missionary for this church, I should probably not be taking her to it or at least investigate. I hadn't read the CS letter. I hadn't read anything that had to do with, um, the problematic things. I didn't know anything. I just, um, at that point, uh, knew that the version of Christ that I worshiped was not the version that was uh, propagated in the church. And I had that sinking feeling. So as a parent, I can relate to that. And um, uh, on threads, you know, the new Twitter threads, as a matter of fact, uh, so I said this yesterday and I just kind of wanted to read out what I thought is that, I, that, that I relate to. I said, why whatever religion is bad for whatever reasons really all centers around if they encourage teenagers or anyone to get married before it makes sense to do so. Um, my bishop interviewed me as a teenager and thought entering into the most important contract was not only not batshit crazy, but good, godly, correct, inspired. I've farted better ideas than child brides. Christ true church, you can do better. And then somebody responded, um, you know, in, in the sarcastic tone, you know, my followers, they're like, well, remember teenage girls are at their peak of fertility and need to have kids before their ovaries shrivel up at 25 when their brain gets fully developed. And to that, I said, jokes on them. I birthed children and loved them too much to not allow my brain to stay underdeveloped suckers. <laughs> Cause there is like this mama bear thing that comes over you where like shit gets real when you have kids and you're like, can I teach them this? And so just going back to what Sarah said, it's like, once you once you reconcile that you have kids and you know that these whitewash versions that they're going to be taught in church uh, is not the most advantageous thing for their spiritual growth intellectually, psychologically, physically, you know that as an adult and you're like, can I really keep up this facade? And just this whole interview is just, it's the most painful story, but just so many beautiful moments of all these women being able to reconnect with their heritage and, uh, going from feeling like they can't even engage in, you know, their tribal dances because those are remnants of their evil, sinful ancestors past um, to being able to, to dive into that and heal those wounds. Um, and there's another part of this that always gets me going. I won't show it, but Sarah talks about the trail of tears and there's a quote from Joseph Smith where Joseph Smith is like trail of tears. Perfect. Awesome. It's because they sinned against Jehovah and native Americans, deserve everything that's coming to them. Just like Mormons. This is your prophet. This, this is your guy. That's your guy. All right, guys. <sighs> so I saved the, um, I saved my top, probably my most favorite one to last. Um, if you want me to like start crying and throwing things, it's, uh, uh, the Lang's interview, uh, the Lang family was a 10 hour 
long interview. And that might sound like, oh, that's a long work day. That's a long time to be fully engaged in an interview. Um, the time flew by. Uh, the stories that they told were so interesting and engaging and important that it was like the most important 10 hours I've ever, I've ever been uh, just, yeah, honored to be graced with my eyes and ears. And uh, Kelly and Heather Lang are a family who were in the military and Kelly is the dad. He was a nuclear submarine commander and um, uh, super, super articulate, smart, smart family. And uh, again, the way that they storytell is fantastic. And they have two gay sons. So two, they have four kids total. Two of their sons came out not only in the Mormon church as being gay, but also in a military family. And uh, I cannot speak highly enough of this family and how sweet they are. And um, it's Britain was, I think, the second oldest son in the family. And the oldest son had a lot of health concerns growing up in his life. And Britain really uh, was trying so hard to be the perfect child and not cause any more concern for his parents or his dad was gone um, on the submarine a lot and his older brother had all these health concerns. And so knowing from a young age that he had this same sex attraction as it's called um, and trying not to cause any problems for his family and just being very OCD or religious OCD called scrupulosity and doing everything that he could to be the best Mormon boy that he could um, thinking that that would cure his queerness and make his family's life more easy. And um, there was a point um, where he's on his mission in Brazil where he is, he's just feeling like he every day is a living hell. And he's, uh, I, the, the, the problem with this clip is that it's, it's so long, but I want to share as much of it as possible. Um, so we'll see how this goes and I'll kind of let him, um, tell the story and um getting to it is a really easy thing where i just click a bunch of buttons and nobody worries that i don't know what i'm doing in these days okay so the title of it is so good too it's called recognizing your two gay sons aren't broken Ugh. like okay uh let's see where i queued this up Nope, it's not this one. It's this one. Growing up gay in an LDS military family. So this is... Uh... It, was like, it was all these crap things at once. And I'm glossing over a lot of the terrible things because at this point, suicidal ideations were increasing. Like had self-harm self started? Uh, yes. Self-harm started even before my mission um, to relieve certain things. But Trigger, trigger warning, yeah. I guess. Uh, so, I'm sorry. Viewers yeah, and that, listeners. Yeah, but but it's a, we, we just did an episode on that. Yeah. So oh, okay. if you want to talk about that a bit. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, for me, like, the, the biggest thing is, like, scratching and cutting. That, that was very, like, helpful because it's be able to relieve pressure or pain that's going on. Um, but that, that started there and, like, our – our high rise was on our apartment was on a very high, high part of the building and there are ideations with that. And so it, essentially those, those, those things, those ideations, all the, all, all that going on was a way to like, just to, to relieve like what, like the pain I was in. And, and it's interesting. The thing that would always like keep me here was not wanting to save myself, but, Oh, I don't want to put someone else through that struggle. That position, that position to, yeah. to like, oh, my family will be sad. I don't want to make them feel that that way. Or I, this poor bus driver, I don't want them to have that trauma. Or this, the whoever has to like X Y Z situation to pick me up, and so, or have to find my body. And so that that's the thing. I'm like, eventually, I'm like, no, I can't do that to my companion. I can't do that, and that's what kept me here. But um, it got it got too much. It was. Um, whew. 
sorry. Um, I got to a point where I I was gonna do it. I had plans, and I um I I as a last ditch effort, I called the mission president to tell him like you know we were gonna already gonna have going to have interviews, and I'm like okay I'll I'll tell him how I'm feeling because. And I, I put an ultimatum, like, if this interview doesn't go well, if I don't feel any different afterwards, I, I'm done. Um, and I went and, bless him, I don't, I don't hold him accountable for this or blame him. I, it's definitely a system of how the church does it. But I told him, um, I confessed to him about mas- masturbation, all those things, finally got it off and felt no different. No, none of the guilt was gone. None of the self-hatred was gone. And then I told him, like, mission president, but I won't say his name. It's like, I, I'm not, well, I need help. I, I, I am, I'm having suicidal ideations. and like, I'm, I'm going to kill myself. And his response was, well, there are lots of elders who have mental problems, and we could get you on medication in the coming weeks. Like, we'll, we'll see about it. And it's like, I'll have you meet with my wife sometime, and you can talk with her about it. And it was just very... It didn't matter. It didn't matter where I was at, and I don't. I don't think he realized where I was at, and I don't blame him. But as, and I, I guess the reason I share that is, these people that are put in charge of you, like bishops and mission presidents, they're not trained psychologists. They're not trained therapists. They don't know the signs. They're not. They don't know, the, like the severity of that situation. And also, because, it's looked down on many of them to send a missionary home. Yeah. So that they. Yeah. Um, so just the idea of the sweet, sweet Britain, um, trying so hard to follow the rules. And he talks earlier in that interview about going to the MTC and, um, he has a lot of sensitivities around food and just losing a lot of weight and just being trying so hard to make his family proud and do what he's committed to do, which is serve a mission and losing weight, not eating, um, being in this system where it's just an everyday living hell and trying to make the best out of it. And in the MTC, he was talking about uh, connecting with a sister missionary that was like his lifeline to joy and peace and happiness. But the uh, MTC president and people being too concerned that he's spending too much time with a female and uh, that they need to stop spending time together and then taking away like his last lifeline at sanity thinking that they're going to engage in sexual activity. And he's like, I'm gay, <laughs> but he can't say that. Right. So, um, yeah. And then John Delenn goes into talking about the, this, this theme comes up a lot. Anytime we'd interview people about their mission stories where they were in desperate need to get out of this situation. My husband is one person who had to come home, um, for mental health reasons on his mission. And it's gotten better with time with, the stigma being removed from not being like so righteous or so unrighteous that you can't finish your mission, but that's still a gigantic uh, pain point and burden to put on 18, 19, 20 year old young people in the church um, that their righteousness is really viewed if they can stick it out on the mission. And um, again, there's just a roulette of what type of mission present you're going to get, what kind of companion you're going to get. Um, things that are so out of your control when you go to a new country, they take away your passport. So if you want to leave in Britain saying like, I am, I just remember him talking about this. I'm going to cry again. Just how he was on this high rise of this building in, in Brazil. And like, it's not stable. He's like, it's not, st- it's not healthy for me to stay here when I'm having fantasies of throwing myself off the balcony and going finally to tell his mission president that and how aloof this man is that has his passport, has all this power over him to tell him that we can get you just take things slow. We can get, and he's like, no, I, I am coming to you because I am. If you send me home right now, Britain explains, he's like, if you send me back to my apartment right now, you're going to find my freaking body. Like, do you not understand what I'm saying right now? And again, these men are supposed to be these spiritual leaders who have this authority that they speak for God. And if you still believe in the Mormon church, even as a missionary, you're like, okay, well, my inner feelings are telling me one thing and all of this hatred and da, 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 da. But this man in spiritual authority over me is telling me that I can stick it out. Maybe can I, you know, um, that's just not how, how it works. And people who are so out of touch with good psychological practices and he, Britain goes on to explain how 
thankfully, uh, the Mish president's wife um, was able to come visit, I think, and see what uh, desperation he was in and be like, whoa, my husband is off his rocker thinking that you can stay another day. Let's get you home, sweetheart. Um, and it was it was it was the female without the without the person authority that actually saw what Britain was going through. Bless her heart. And he got sent home from that point on. Um, but I have to play. This is one of my very favorite important clips um, because you always hear this. I think. Sorry, let me start over. It is probably the most gaslighting, obnoxious, horrific, <sighs> uncomfortable ignorant thing that I'm sure queer people in the church have to go through constantly that if they just tried enough, they would have been able to become straight. It's there's a, there's a reason why you're queer and you will be able to overcome it with enough faith and scripture study and blessings and stuff. And I think I ask, um, uh, I think I ask them here what they want to respond to with that. And their response is always chilling. Um, so, swimmer and okay so john is talking about church. it's the altitude yeah, or it's the region it's the rocky mountain region it's it's everywhere it's 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 a national thing like mormon apologists have worked overtime to say that it, there's no connection it's unfair to tie lgbtq mormon youth suicide to the behaviors and the actions of the Mormon church, that, that those who do that are just taking, taking a tragic thing and trying to pin it on the church with some agenda to kind of weaponize a tragic situation to then blame the church. If, if you, Britain, and then Mason, if you want to tag on, if you wanted to look into the camera and talk to the type, the, the people who try and who try and justify and excuse the LGBTQ Mormon youth suicide as something other than a, a natural reaction to the Mormon Church's doctrines and policies and, and actions to LGBTQ Mormon youth, what 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 if you had a chance to say something, yeah, what would um, you say? <laughs> Make ass bitches like bruh. Was it the altitude? <laughs> no. No. Sorry, it just it makes me so sad and angry. Yes. I I didn't choose this. And my whole life I've been told I'm broken. I'm not broken. I'm not waiting for some resurrection to fix me. <laughs> what took you to that point? What was it? If you had to summarize it. To what point? I'm sorry. But what, like, what was it about your Mormon upbringing uh, that led you to the point of not wanting to live anymore? Summarize it, if you, yeah, if you don't mind. Yeah. Um, the fact that, sorry, I'm just want to be right. That I'm not enough. I, that me myself, just being me, and who I am, that I'm, I'm worthless, and the fact that I'm not living up to standards that have been set out by a third party, and, and I'm not meeting these high demands. That that's what led led me to it. It's it's like it's not. Why, and especially the fact that this idea that, well, if this life is just a blip, why not go to the next life? Why not get this over with? Because if this is just meant to be a trial and it's worthless and I'm supposed to be fixed in the next life, I better just die right now. Why not die? Because I'm, I'm not doing anything for this world. I'm useless, according to the church. Mason, your story's coming, but do you want to add anything to this? It's just so frust like part of my language earlier, but like it's like so invalidating. <laughs> it's like obviously everyone can have their own opinions about everything and every like but like <laughs> if these apologists, they've never been in our shoes. They don't know what it's like. And so it's just it's uh, it's so like angering too, like 
just to see these people go and like dude honey don't worry like i don't know it, it's just so horrible <sighs> because statements like that what it says it, it just it goes back to the that that pushing on is like oh we're not at fault you must be broken you must have a problem with you it, it pushes it like it's not it's not a church's fault these these youth these lgbt youth they must be screwed up because they're the ones killing themselves it's not we're not we have no part and that's like like take ownership for something at least like it's not it's it's like pushing like like the things that are happening now are on other people not us like what it's just like it, they're so oblivious. I don't know, and I was like that too. And I'm not. I'm sorry. I'm not judging people for being oblivious. oblivious but like teen shade, like, bruh. Uh, I love those boys so much. Um, again, like the the platform of Mormon stories of what John does, and the the 16 years of people being able to share stories like that. And um, uh, Ray was saying that. They cried the first time they watched this too. I'm like that's what it's all about. It's about people being able to share their stories and feeling heard and seen and uh, the audience being able to connect with that. And the vulnerability that the boys shared there is I'm, I've never been that vulnerable in my life on camera. I'll tell you that much. Um, I'm messy and authentic in other ways, but that's, it's so important um, that people are able to really listen and understand what, uh, queer youth go through and queer people generally in the church and to not make light of the, the doctrines that inform their, their suicidal ideation, their depression, their anxiety, um, all while trying to fit into a box that's just not made for everybody. There's a box within Mormonism that works for some people. Um, and, uh, or at least they think that it works for them. And, uh, when it, when that box is supposed to be a one size fits all for what 8 billion people on earth and all, all races, all genders, all sexual orientations. Uh, I'm sorry. The, the, the reason why the church has to hate gay people so much, the reason why they're amicus briefs, the video that I did last night uh, where the church doesn't want to be looking like social pariahs, for their beliefs around hating gay people and trying to marginalize them because it just makes the church look more untrue. The more people realize that queer people, um, they want to, they want to exist in this world with the same rights, not more rights and not less. Uh, they want to exist on an equal playing field with the society that's been set up that they are trying to find a way to operate within. And it just points to more evidence of, the structure of the church. It's not true. It's not this, this two gender man, woman, anything can be overcome through the atonement of Jesus Christ. All of that theology, all that doctrine, all of those teachings just fall on their face and their remnants of a, in a, of a gilded age that we have progressed through. We have better evidence and understanding of the reasons people are the way that they are. And it's not demonic possession. It's not Satan a whole, coming a hold of them, but the church is, frightened AF that queer people are here to stay and cannot be electroshocked out of existence. And it, all it does is just prove that their plan of salvation, their doctrines um, are not what they're purported to be. They're not true. Um, and uh, they can bully people into submission as much as they want, but these stories are going to keep being told. These people are still going to exist. And uh if, if you have to write an amicus brief to the Supreme Court to say that, okay, while they exist, can our hating of them still be kosher? Can we, can we make that? Supreme Court, are you in charge of that? <laughs> um, it's obnoxious and strongly, uh, strongly uh, against all of the things that I thought Mormonism was supposed to be about, about free will, about uh, free agency and... Um, and mourning with those that mourn and caring about the plight of people. Um, you know, Jesus saying uh, that if I'm too tired to think of the quote, <laughs> the quote about um, 
like, you know, if your brother asks you to walk with you a mile, walk with him too. those kinds of things. And, um, I want to make sure I, I get in. My husband's calling me right now cause I'm an hour late coming home from dinner. Uh, so everybody donate right now so that my husband is not mad that I'm coming home late. And, uh, I just, I can't end this without my favorite, the chills of what then after this, it was a three-parter. And then right after this, um, uh, their, their dad, Kelly explains what it was like when they found out that Britain, when Britain came to them and said that he was gay, the story of them finding out as a, as a, like a faithful Mormon couple, what they said and did after mic drop freaking like the period on the end of every sentence of like, that is how you freaking show up for your gay kids in, in Mormonism. It's so, oh, I get chills. Anytime that there's a Mormon parents who, when their kids come to them and say, I'm gay and they do what kind of the opposite of like the Gerardo's story of where they are. Wow. That must be hard for you. How can I love and support you? Like there's gotta be something wrong with the church. Cause there ain't nothing wrong with you kid. Like anyway, so let me show Kelly's clip in a second and just wanted to say thank you so much. Uh, trick Zord said, thanks for five bucks. I was raised like shiny, happy people, Gothard fundy, uh, SBC. These stories help me so much. Uh, that can just, that can be just as much of a cult. Thanks for what you do. Thank you so much. Glad you got out. Thank you so much for the 50 bucks. Yes. Appreciate you guys. Everything, every donation honestly is like the only way that I pay my bills. No exaggeration. Uh, and I'm trying to do live streams like this every day. And, uh, it is so important to make this type of content, but I also am not able to make it if I, uh, make my money at it. Sorry, sorry to be so straightforward like that. But uh, places to donate in the description right now. I have a Venmo uh, at KRB and a donor box link and a Patreon link. And um, yeah, let me just show this last clip of K K K Kelly Lang. And it might be kind of long or it might be kind of short. We'll see how much time I have. It was, like, it was um, okay. But I, I was just, I was shocked, but not in a shock of like anger or anything like that. Of just, how do we go? How do we move just forward? Just Britain. Yeah. <laughs> so he's our son. Britain's Britain. I remember though, him. we talked for a couple hours and then we went to bed that night. But I didn't go to sleep. I did not sleep an ounce that night, and all I could remember is that shifting from that intense moment of love, all of a sudden I started remembering everything the prophets had said, everything that was in for the strength of the youth, everything that was in the miracle of forgiveness, everything that was in all the pamphlets, the Boyd K. Packer talks, the Neely Maxwell, the, the, going back to the Kimball talks, going back to the, in the 50s, the 60s, all the, the shame and the blame on parents if their children are gay, that it was a choice, that it was a, never born this way. How could God ever make him this way, as Boyd K. Packer would say? And it went through my mind. And that entire night, I, you talk about torment. And Alma in the Book of Mormon, I was tormented for you know, three days and three nights, whatever it was. I was tormented. That was my hell. If I'd ever been through hell, it was that night. Because I could not come to the fact that, that ugly love I felt for my son, who I now knew if there's anybody in the world that could convince me it wasn't a choice. Because up until that point, I still had in the back of my mind, it's still a choice. It's still, you know, you can choose not to be gay. But if there was one person, and I told people this before I ever knew Britain was gay, if there was one person in my life that I ever thought could see God the Father and Jesus Christ as Joseph Smith did, it was Britain. That's how good he was growing up. And so getting to this point, and I realized Britain's not going to lie to me. This is not a choice. So if it's not a choice, what is it then? He's born this way, and I could not get, come to that bridge that gap. And I texted the bishop that morning when I finally had to go to work. I said, I can no longer do this. I said, my son came out to me as gay last night. And I told him the story in text, a very long text. I said, I cannot serve as your counselor any longer because of the things that have been said and what I'm going through right now. I cannot, can no longer uphold the brethren for what they've said. And I need to get some peace and resolution. I need some answers. He was very loving and very kind in his response. He said, I understand. 
there was more to it, but it, he was not judgmental. He was a good, good man. He really is. Two days later, Britton and I are talking, and Britton comes to me and says, Dad, I, I can do this. I can get married to a woman. I, I can still stay in the church. And I'm thinking to myself, how in the hell can you do this? Because I, there, I'm thinking in my mind, if you told me that I had to marry a man to get the celestial kingdom, I'm like, all right, hell it is. <laughs> like, there's not a chance. I mean, John, you're a good looking dude, but oh, hell no. <laughs> That's the way I feel. And so, but, but that gave me faith. And I said, if Britain can do it, I can do it. If he's going to stay, I'm going to stay. And so I pushed through. And I pushed through for another year, serving, giving, working, doing everything I could, studying, trying to make peace, giving talks about how to stay, stay in the boat, don't give up the ship, but never telling anybody the mental gymnastics I was doing. And at this point, I'm winning the gold. Hmm. We get to January. The, my bishop is sick. I'm still carrying the ward. Get into February. My midshipman dies. COVID's starting to come down. I'm going through incredible pressures and stress. And I'm having some difficulty with a certain leader at the Naval Academy, and I won't name the name because for legal reasons. And that whole adage that God will never give you more than you can handle, at this point, I'm saying bullshit. Bullshit. I'm at my wits end. And then I get that text from Mason. That says? Mom, Dad, I'm just like Britain. I'm gay too. <laughs> and now my reaction is, it's the very same thing. I feel that love for my son. All right. And now it's two. Now it's two. And now I'm thinking in my head, and I, I at this point call my bishop, and I said, I said, I have done everything the church has ever asked for me. I've paid my 100% tithing the entire time. I've served if every calling. I've done the mission. You, you know, everything they ask, time, talents, everything in the temple as they talk about. I never say no. And then you look at the statements for the brother, and if, the, if your parents do everything they're supposed to, your children will turn out right. Family home evenings, family scripture study, family parent. And yet I've got two sons now that are gay. What, what gives? Why? And I'm asking for answers, and they can't give me answers. And as I go forward asking for answers, I'm getting these platitudes. So they just need to pray, and, you know, basically pray away the gay. Just stay. Just pray. Don't give up the faith. Stay Be in patient. the boat. Yeah. Whew. Uh, so hopefully you guys can tell just from those little clips how powerful those interviews are um, and how honored I was to sit there and be part of them. Um, it's just such a, a family with so much integrity. And uh, Kelly goes on to tell the story about how um, his dad, he, he tells his dad that, you know, your grandsons are gay and things like that. And basically such a powerful story. I hope you guys can go back and, and watch the full thing of him telling that. But his, his, his uh, dad uh, gets remarried to a woman just a few weeks, I think, after like his, his mom died. Kelly's mom passes away. And his, ma, his dad is out there getting remarried within like two weeks, something ridiculous and obnoxious uh, to like his, his therapist or something that's like severely immoral. And his dad is still very stal stalwart and Mormon. And he's casting judgment on his grandsons for being gay. And Kelly's like, you can't even go two weeks without sex. You can't even go two weeks without wanting companionship. And you're asking my sons to sign up for a lifetime of an, and an eternity without companionship. And just, oh man, the integrity, like everything that you would think about, like that, that typical, like military man, uh, all of that force and like masculinity put towards their children and put towards uh, empathy and put towards standing up for what's right. Like, whoa, if that was that, if that was ever you as military member, oh my God, we would be on good, we'd be on good terms. Like, oh man, I just want to replicate this family. They're such sweethearts. And uh, another story I love from that podcast too is uh, Kelly talking about this is during the don't ask, don't tell policy um, within the military that you can't ask if someone's gay, you can't say that you're gay. And he was on his submarine and just the, the tight knit 
described it, it feels like watching a movie their interview you feel like you're watching band of brothers hearing kelly describe what it was like to be a, a submarine commander and just the t- the tight-knit family that was bon- that was there and that he's the commander over all of these these midshipmen as i think they're called i don't know the terms and finding a note on the floor that indicated that one of them was gay and finding it and what he's supposed to do as the commander is to report one of them for being gay and apparently maybe having like a relationship or something with another one of the crew members there and uh, picking that note up. I love this story. I love, Oh man. And then Kelly just tells the story about, he just finds the note, picks it up, sees who realizes this person's gay. And is like, not a thought in his mind. Is he going to kick out one of the best, uh, you know, midshipmen? He's just walks right up to him says, Hey man, something, something gives him a handshake, hands the note back to him, letting him know, like, I found this. I kind of know, but we're all good. Your secret's safe with me. It's all right. And just lets him walk away, not having to tell any other higher ups that one of his crew members is gay. I'm just like, so it's, it's the, it's again, it's that morning with those that mourn. It's that Christ-like love and empathy and compassion that Mormonism doesn't get to put a stamp on and say that they own. It's like this intuitive beauty and connectivity that is just alive and well. And people who also just happen to be Mormon and when they need to side with what is right and good and beautiful and helps people flourish and blossom. Um, there's just so many beautiful connections with interviewees of uh, people who've gone through horrible and harrowing things and came out on the other side and are vulnerable enough to share their stories and uplift others and, tell people that you can get through it. So uh, I can just wrap up for a moment and tell everyone how grateful I am for yeah the time I spent at Mormon Stories was a huge honor. Just hilarious that John was like, hey, that girl on TikTok who makes all of those things, she'll make a good co-host. And me being like, I could be a crazy person. And some people are like, yeah, you are. <laughs> um, but overall, uh, the, the audience there being very kind and receptive and grateful that I was on the podcast. So people who watched and tuned in, and were supportive of me being, even being on it. I didn't win over, over anyone, but I had a I had a really good time. I was so so grateful for that opportunity and the connections that I made with people. Um, being able to be so intently uh, in tune with having to listen. No, you can't check out in that job. <laughs> you have to be listening intently for ten hours straight, basically, with like a few bathroom breaks and lunches here and there. But um, I I I love the ex Mormon community. I love the Mormon community. Um, my heart and soul is a person who was born into this structure, found out it wasn't true, but I care so deeply about the people who are trying to make sense of all of this messiness. Um, Thank you so much. Um, Any other final super chats? You can get them in right now. Any final questions or anything on topic or off topic um, you want to ask before I have to go and I'll try to throw them up on screen. Camille said, I love your content. Thank you for sharing your life, humor skills with us. Thank you so much. And, um, uh, a couple other things I wanted to read off. Um, oh, and thank you again for the super chat. Appreciate that. And uh, Ray said hearing about his talking about Britain's scrupulosity is when I discovered I had it too. And um, yeah, again, it just goes back to when people are, sh- when you were, you live in a system where scrupulosity is rewarded and you don't know that it is actually something that is not for your benefit, but for the benefit of keeping you like psychologically suppressed and dependent on them. Um, There's just so many things to say about scrupulosity and the way that religions use it for their gain and not for the betterment of the individual congregant and million different reasons why Mormonism isn't true. It's also just, it's not, it's not helpful. It's not helpful at human flourishing. Um, And lastly, uh, also Tim asked, said that they're a Patreon member and I'm not getting any notifications about when you go live, any chance that you could tell me, uh, where you're, you're not getting it wrong. I, uh, I, uh, I, I feel bad that, <laughs> that sometimes people, I don't want to give them too many notifications on my Patreon. Uh, but I will go on my Patreon after this and try to figure out what people, uh, want. Maybe I should do just more like private live streams for people over on Patreon. Um, but I haven't been telling people when I'm going live because it's pretty much just going to be random time whenever, but uh, I just, I fear that I'm giving people too many notifications. I am sensitive to burdening people with what I'm up to too much. Um, 
And then Redbone said, play the Jaredite submarine clip. Uh, so one fun thing is that I did on that, that interview, <laughs> waited till the very end of this entire interview and uh, till all the trauma was all discussed. And then final closing remarks. I'm like, so Kelly, a question that's been on my mind. And I asked this nuclear submarine commander and I'm like, how was it that you were a submarine commander and the Jaredite submarines, the barges in the Book of Mormon, uh, no questions there. You never had any problems with that. And then Kelly was so adorable. And he's like, ah, oh, you know what, Kara? Like <laughs> he was, he knew all of the mechanisms of how difficult it is to, to get a, a seafaring ship to go underwater. And the, the Book of Mormon has a story about after the Tower of Babel came down and people make fun of me. How I say Tower of Babel, is it Tower of Babel? I don't care. Uh, that I'm talking like ancient, ancient myths and stories that are literally in the Book of Mormon, as if they are real things that happen. That falls down. The Jaredite people they create these eight wooden barges that are sealed, apparently in some way. They have a screw, like a cork at the top and a cork at the bottom, so that if they flip underwater, that they can like flip over and then like uncork it and get air and like all of their livestock and feces is just tumbling all around. And this is a real story in the book of Mormon of like, yeah, and God, God protected them and God did that. And that's how those people got to America. It's different from the Nephite and Lamanite crew coming over separate group of people, but they did eventually meet up in the Americas. They're like, God's chosen people. You, me, huh? huh? So yeah, they had, they have literal uh, submarines and barges and Mormons will get on me and they'll say they weren't submarines. The Book of Mormon says that God would like put them under the waves and they would sink down into the sea. So if there is a vessel that goes underwater, I'm calling it a submarine. And I'm sorry that we have to play semantics about uh, wooden barges, ancient wooden barges uh, that carried a bunch of ancient people from the Tower of Babel. I'm sorry that this is the semantic game. I don't even want to play it because it's so <laughs> it's so obviously laughable and not true. Um uh, and also thanks for the super chat, Nutty. Oh, but they will claim to own your goodness. It's got to be processed into Mormon grand goodness or obliterated. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I talked about this last night where <laughs> people, I had a comment yesterday from a Mormon guy on my, one of my videos where I was doing something talented where you could obviously see that this is a talented girl. You know how I do on my TikToks, and they're like, her talent is because of Mormonism. And when I was Mormon, I used to think that too. It's like, if you are good at public speaking or, uh, you know, have a good job or a good education, it's because that was like that, uh, characteristic to be high achieving was, uh, was, uh, what's the word <sighs> was stamped into you and was, was bred into you through the teachings of Mormonism. And I'm like, kind like I I learned how to write sketches with my friends at girls camp I'm like you guys can have that one I had lots of opportunities just to give talks and speak in public um but overall the instinct to uh to to search after what is righteous no matter the cost is going to be used against you <laughs> that's like you don't own that principle there's so many things within Mormonism where they think that they own like a good principle of like morality or integrity or honesty while when we use those things, the most who gives a crap about who can write a sketch or speak in public. We're talking about the things that the best societies, marriages, friendships, relationships, um, cultures, governments are based on is like integrity, honesty, and all of those things. Uh, if people are not going to utilize them against the very system that apparently like, bred that into them, then you're asking for an authoritarian cult and, uh, an unquestionable dogma. You're not asking for anything, uh, that is beautiful, that, that creates all, like I just said, like the healthiest people and healthiest society possible. You're asking for, for, uh, uh, to respect a cult's dogma. Um, if I'm not allowed to use that, that I learned <laughs> within the church, Does that makes sense. Anyway. Um, uh, end this now we're two hours and seven minutes in um thank you guys so much for tuning in if you want me to keep doing live streams like this every day uh and also i have other um i have a couple other long format videos that are going to be more edited and more professional uh put together that i'll try to put those out um 
in the next, you know, random times that I can and short TikToks and reposting my old TikToks. So I have a, I have a buffet that I can offer here, but if you find these live streams valuable and I hope that you will definitely press the like button to let the algorithm know that you didn't just watch it, but you liked it and leaving a comment on your favorite Mormon stories interviews. Um, don't forget to say, obviously yours, Kara, <laughs> the first one, I'm just kidding. Uh, make sure to, to, yeah, th this comment section could be a great resource for other people who are looking for a good place to start when listening to Mormon stories interviews, because there are so many, some people don't know where to start. So I'd love for this comment section to be uh, a good uh, community place for people to, to talk about what resonated with them and in, in different interviews that they saw. Anyone who's been on Mormon stories, Colby uh, has been in the chat. Thanks so much. And if you've been on Mormon stories, go ahead and leave a comment uh, um, about your experience and, uh, uh, and uh, yeah, the liking, the subscribing, the hitting the bell for notificationing, the clicking the buttoning to go over to my patroning so that you can be part of my ho town and uh, help keep this content sustainable. I truly, I cannot tell you enough how much I survive on donations and it means so, so much that people appreciate this content and are willing to give me uh, some of their time, their ear to share my thoughts and feelings and stuff. Uh, and again, just try to platform other, other people's experiences that um, have been much more severe that I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna be able to be the content creator that shares these stories. So whatever I can do to make these voices heard, I'm going to try to do. So if you like this type of format and live stream, I'll try to do one every day of literally giving myself like an hour, two hours tops to kind of prep something. And uh, I'm willing to hear whatever feedback you have, anything that you think can help me improve. And um, again, donors and comments and feedback. Super, super helpful. Thank you guys so much for supporting my channel and I'll let you go. Bye.